and, uh, and let's just pray. Lord, thank you, first of all, that you've given so much to us beyond what we deserve, beyond what we could ever earn or in any way cause to happen for ourselves through your grace and mercy. Thank you for the faithful giving of your people that we together get to do and have an impact on our city and, Lord, beyond with our missionaries, with the church plants and all that you allow us to do, Lord, through the faithful giving that each of us do. Lord, it's sometimes a great joy. It's sometimes, ah, and then sometimes it's like, Lord, it's such a little thing we get to do based on how much you've done for us. So, Lord, thank you that we get to give back to you, the one who's given so much to us. So bless the giving. Help us to be wise stewards together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So grab a seat if you would. And open your Bible to the epistle of Second John near the back of the New Testament. And I want to start by asking a question. Did you know that Winston Churchill was 65 years old when he became Britain's prime minister. And not long after that, he went to war with Hitler. It's, it's an amazing situation. Oscar Hammerstein was 60, in his mid-60s when he wrote lyrics for The Sound of Music. Anyone ever see that uh, movie, The Sound of I think everyone's seen it about 64 times. But amazing lyrics. Nelson Mandela. I had the privilege to go to South Africa one time. Nelson Mandela was 71 years old when he was released from being in prison there for 20 years. And four years later, he was elected president of South Africa. Amazing story of his life. Michelangelo was 72 when he designed the dome of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And John Glenn was 77 years old when he traveled into space. And you say, why are you saying that? Because the Apostle John, who wrote this epistle towards the end of his life, the last living one who had walked with Jesus, the last living disciple, he was somewhere, scholars believe, between 95 years old and 100 when he wrote this epistle. And I say all that to say this, that usually when a person is at that age, at that place or time in life, you've hopefully reached some level of maturity. And he's writing and dealing with very significant questions about problems and people. And I think you finally reach an age where you maybe answer some of the questions like, who am I? Why am I here? Kind of figuring that out in life and focusing in on it. And, and what matters most to me and what matters most to God and what matters least? And I think John's in that category. He's at that place in life where he knows who he is and what he's here for and, and what matters most. And he begins to deal with some of those topics of what matters most to the church, to one another. And so he's writing this letter. And it really is a letter. It's, it's quite an a interesting personal correspondence. It's not about history. It's not about doctrine so much or theological teaching, as it is a heartfelt letter that he's writing, I believe, to a local church. It's kind of like we get to read someone's mail here. It'd be like, I mean, just think in your wildest dreams, you found a, a laptop from uh, Hunter Biden or something. You, I mean, just if something happened like that, and, and you got, <laughs> you got to, to read it, just suppose. Or even a letter that, that, or an email that, that Donald Trump wrote to his campaign manager that no one had ever seen. And you got to read it. Well, we get to read a letter from a very mature, experienced apostle, disciple of Jesus who walked with him to a local church 
to a group of people that it's said of in the book of Acts, these are the people who turn the world upside down. And John's addressing that group. He's talking to them. It's an amazing scenario. And he's dealing not only with what he believes is important and significant, but he's also dealing with problems. Because someone once said this, every and wherever you go that there's people, there's problems. There just is. Lynn and I recently, uh, we bought a house right after Ivan and we, the house was built in 1995, and as we could afford, we've been slowly renovating the house from the inside and out. So recently, we bit the big bullet of tearing out all the tile and putting down different flooring. Don't know if you've ever did that. I would wait till after you died if I were you to do that. <laughs> because it is so dusty. We, we, we actually moved out. We're staying at a condo on the beach. We thought, okay, we'll solve this problem. We'll move out on the beach. We'll we'll be out there till it's done. It's still not done, and they're working on it today. And we we had to move back in, and, I mean, it is dusty. You open your drawers in your kitchen, and it's full of dust. All your silverware has got dust on it. The curtains are full of dust. So we think, okay, we're at the beach. We're good. And so two nights before we have to check out, it's like the night the storm's coming through. You know, it's like you don't know what's really going to happen with this storm. Is it going to shift or what's going to happen? So we're out there, and um, we have our dog. That's a whole other scenario with the dog in the condo and elevators and all that. So back on track. About 3.30 in the morning, the night of the storm, we're laying there, and all of a sudden we hear over these speakers, I guess they're in all the condos, in the hallways, this light's going around, it's going, emergency, emergency, leave the building, do not use the elevator, emergency, emergency, and I'm waking up and going, what in the world? So, you know, getting the clothes on, you know, looking at your hair, making sure you don't look like a, you know, a terrorist or something, so... We get our clothes on, we get the dog, and you can't use the elevator, so we open the, we're on the sixth floor, we open the door, and we're going to go down the stairs, but there's this guy, he's huge, he's like an athlete or something, he must be in town for surgery, because his whole leg from the top of the hip down was in this huge cast, and there's no way you can get around him in the stairway, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to die up here because of this guy, <laughs> and, and I I think Lynn said she could take him, so I said, okay, let's, 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 so we kind of, he saw us, and he kind of moved, you know, he moved over wincing, you know, and he moved over, and we just said, God bless you, hope you make it down, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> we were kind. I said all that to say, you have problems, surprises, good and bad, and John is addressing some here, <laughs> not, not a, not a, condo with a lame guy in front of you, but he's dealing with an issue. And I just want to read the first two verses. We're going to go through six verses together. And he starts off like this, the elder, that's John speaking of himself, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us, he says, forever. So John identifies himself as an elder. It means one who holds some kind of leadership position or office in the church, an overseer. It also could mean someone of maturity, of age, which John would would fit both of those situations. And he's sharing with them about truth, and he's sharing with them about love. He'll tie the two together. We'll see that. But he saw saw himself as one of authority, trying to speak into that local congregation's situations. I mean, leadership is mentioned all through the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 13, it even goes so far to say, Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that you would be unprofitable for you. So, so John 
he's an overseer. He, he's, he's one who's caring and trying to give direction. And he's answering questions about life and about love and about truth. And so he addresses this elect lady and her children. And many believe it's not addressed to a specific lady, although that is one way some have interpreted it. But most believe that he's speaking to a local church. Church is the bride of Christ, many times used in that feminine way, that feminine name. And John says to the elect lady and her children, individual people in that local fellowship, that local church. John most likely didn't identify himself or the lady or the church because there was persecution at that time by those who were against the church, who were coming down on the church. And so to protect them, John just uses the name elder to protect himself and the name lady and children to protect those from authorities who could even cause life threats to them. So John focuses here in this letter and in his aged wisdom and in his experience walking with Jesus, once again on this concept, this idea of truth and love. In fact, in, if you read John's writing, the Gospels, all three of these epistles, the book of Revelation, John over and over and over again deals with truth and love, love and truth. And here's what I've found over the years. What holds us together as Christians? What unites us under Jesus Christ? is these two things, the truth and the love. The truth that we've received about him and the love that we have given to one another from him. That's what causes us to become one, truth and love. You know, if you say, well, hey, what holds you together? What, what makes you, you know, come together and be a church and, and be unified? Well, it's truth that we know. And it's love that we experience and share. You wouldn't say, well, you know what really keeps us together is skinny jeans. No, and it doesn't. Well, it's, 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 you know, I like sushi and they like sushi. That's what, you know, we're really into it. Our Thai food. No, it, it's, it's love and truth. It's not political parties. It's not social compatibility. John combines these two, and we'll see it here in this passage, uh, truth and love. And they must hold hands because truth without love can be pretty harsh. It can be pretty offensive. It can be pretty legalistic. You know, some people, you see them coming, and you think, okay, about to hear some truth. You don't want to be that guy you don't want to be that girl that when people see you coming, they think, oh, great. You know, they're going to tell me something about me or they're going to hit me with some, you know, big truth. It has to be mixed with love. And on the other side, it can't just be all love. You don't want to be that person that just, well, I just want them to be happy I just want them to be free. I just want them to know I care. I don't want to judge. But you do want to tell them the truth, right? And you want to tell it to them in love. You know, when, when it's, it's the thing about the kid, you know, the little kid with the fork sticking it in the socket. You want to tell them the truth about the consequence of that if they've got a fork in their hand, right? And you keep them from it. You want to do that with young adults. You want to tell them the truth, in love, about sex, about gender, about life, because you want to protect them from the consequences of a world that's telling them everything but the truth sometimes. And you want to tell them the truth, but you want to do it in love, and, and love is powerful. And you want to speak, and you want to, you know, it's like when, when Jesus was called into this scenario where they were trying to trap this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They're all standing there. They got the truth in their hands. She committed adultery. The law says, the commandment is, stone her. And Jesus, yeah, you got the truth. You're right. But which one of you guys 
has never sinned. Go ahead and cast the first stone. You know the story. They all walk away. And finally, Jesus doesn't say, whew, man, good thing we avoided the truth. No, he said, where are those who condemn you? I I don't see any, Lord. He says, neither do I, but go and live a different lifestyle. Don't, Don't do that anymore. There's consequences for it. And he spoke the truth in love. And our relationships with our kids, our spouses, one another in the church can't and won't survive without both truth and love. It's the way we grow up. It's the way we change. I I need to be in a context where someone can speak the truth to me, but they can do it in love. That's that's what the Lord does. In in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about this in verse 14, that we should no longer be children. Now, let me just stop there for a second. In other words, we should grow up, and we should be able to embrace truth And we should be able to hear it from someone who loves us, not tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, which would be that which is false, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But here's how it happens. Speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And this is so important for us as believers to be able to embrace and be a part of both of those. John says another reason truth is vital, and he mentions it here in this passage, and I'll read it. He says, because of truth, verse 2, which abides in us, and then he says, will be with us forever, forever, forever. Truth doesn't change. It stays the same forever. Truth doesn't morph from age to age or generation to generation. Truth will, as Scripture says, will be with us forever. And if you're not careful, the culture all around us wants to reshape, wants to silence the truth of the Bible. But it doesn't change. The truth about Jesus hasn't changed. The truth about marriage hasn't changed. The truth about sex hasn't changed. The truth about creation and eternity and life, it's still the same. And people need to know that it's the same in love. See, I want to say something truthful to you in love about Jesus and about the church of Jesus Christ. And it's a very simple statement, and I want you to listen. Christianity, number one, is simple. Don't complicate it. Don't think you have to be this great theologian or person who knows Greek or Hebrew or all this to to live a Christian life or talk to others about Jesus. Number two, Christianity's good. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Jesus, it's good. Don't you like stuff that's good? This is good. Uh, It's positive. It's positive. The the message of the gospel and and the truth of Jesus Christ is one of the most positive things you could ever share with somebody. It's It's a great thing. It's good. It's positive. And I will say this. It's hopeful. You tell someone about the the love of Jesus Christ and the hope of heaven and that your life can change and you can start over again. It's good. It's positive. It's hopeful. And it is beautiful. The gospel of Jesus Christ is one of the most beautiful things in the world. That God so loved the world. I mean, how much more beautiful can it get than that? That God reached out to you and I. It's truthful. It's loving. And people need goodness, hope, beauty, love, and truth. Amen? And that's what it is. That's the story of the Bible. I need them. You need them. We need to share our faith and our life in truth. And in love, because our crazy culture has a lot of non-truths that's creeping into our culture. I was reading the other day about Jesus and how many people believe in him in our culture right now and all that's going on around us and the reshaping of different truths and the way things are being taught. And one of the things that was kind of coming forth in this book I was reading is that Jesus is kind of becoming like in some parts of our culture, in people's hearts and minds, like a myth, 
like some kind of contradiction stories and teachings and, and Jesus kind of being pushed into this category where he's like Santa. Now, if you believe in Santa, I'm sorry. Or like the Easter Bunny. A made-up, imaginary person for weak people who need help and comfort. And there's a trend in our culture where people think that way. Oh, you need Jesus? I'm sorry. But Jesus is real. The early Christians passed down verbally, and they passed down in written form, records of the lives and the teachings of Jesus Christ in very detailed ways. Both Jews and secular individuals, Romans, historians, wrote about Jesus as one of the most well-known people that ever lived. Josephus, a secular Jewish historian, wrote about, if you ever read his, haven't read his works, you should, about the impact Jesus had on the Roman culture as a historian during that time. And I want you to hear this. Please know this. And, and I'm preaching to the choir here. Jesus is real. He lived. He taught. He died. And he rose again. And he is the most established historical figure who has ever influenced and impacted human history more than any other person that ever lived on the face of the earth. He just is. I mean, I, I've traveled a little bit around the world, and everywhere I've gone, there's been a cross, there's been a church, there's been a symbol or something that represents Jesus Christ everywhere I've gone. And anywhere you travel in the world, you'll see something that represents Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was real, number one. Because he lived, number two. Because he's who he's claimed to be, number three. And number four, he's impacted millions and millions of life from century to century and generation to generation. Jesus is the real deal. He changed my life forever. Another thing is, some say that this whole thing of the resurrection of Jesus, well, you know, it was spiritual, it wasn't bodily, it's not really real. No, 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 wait a minute. The resurrection of Jesus Christ? A myth? Impossible. They say, well, the disciples stole the body, the tomb was sealed, and somehow they got in. No, the, the Romans made sure the Jews were emphatic. The last thing they wanted after finally plotting and convincing the, the Romans to put Jesus to death, the last thing they wanted was some crazy story about Jesus rising from the dead. But Jesus appeared after he rose. Listen, he appeared for 40 days to over 500 people on 12 different occasions. 12 times Jesus showed up. Oh, that, that's a myth. Well, wait a minute. He, he showed up once. Well, he showed up twice, three times, four. John, are you going to 12? No, I'll stop here. But he showed up 12 different times to over 500 people. I mean, that's more than enough to convince any judicial court in our day that it was a reality. Here's the thing. Not only did Jesus live, he's the greatest historical figure that ever lived on the face of the earth. He rose from the dead with unmistakable proof. He's alive. You say, well, I don't believe it. So 500 people lied and kept the lie a secret? You ever tried to get three people to keep a secret? I mean, I've got a wife and three kids. If I called my daughter, I'm not saying my daughter talks a lot. But if I called her, or maybe even one of my sons, I'll throw them in the, in the bus, for the bus too. And I said, hey, don't tell your mom. That's most likely she'd find out somehow. But none of them told her. The, the, the reality, in fact, the grim reality is that the many who claim they love Jesus and believe the truth, well, they were killed for saying it. They were killed for believing it. 
they lost their lives, and I'm sure they wouldn't go to some kind of execution for a lie. And no one removed the body. How, how do you keep that a secret? I know where the body of Jesus is. Oh my gosh, I know where it is, and everybody's lying about it. No. Now, there's a lot of other non-truths that are in our culture, like that Christianity is for the weak. You look up some of the men and the women who've given their lives and who walk through the things they walk through for the sake of Jesus Christ, I would submit to you they're far from weak. They're far from weak physically, and they're far from weak intellectually, which is another lie the culture says, oh, they're just stupid people. They don't really understand. No, some of the greatest minds that have ever lived have been believers here on this earth. They're not weak physically. They're not weak mentally. Another thing they say is, oh, the Bible, you know, it's just, it's, it's anti-sex. It's anti-sex. Adam and Eve were naked in a garden. That doesn't sound like anti-sex. It's anti-sex outside the bounds of security where there's a man and a woman who love each other and made a commitment to one another as husband and wife, and there's not an insecure thing about being used. It's anti-sex that way. Someone told me that the other day. Oh, oh the Bible's anti-sex. I said, no, it's not. My son has five kids, and he's a Christian. <laughs> you could go on and on. Not about sex, but you could go on and on with these non-truths. So, so let's speak the truth, let's live the truth, and let's do it in love. Because look, look what John says. He says, the elder, that's John, to the elect lady, the local church, to her children, the parishioners, whom I love in the truth, not only I, but also those who've known the truth, because the truth which abides in us will be forever. Grace, mercy, and peace. Now, I want you to look at verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. It's not like I hope you have it. And here's how it'll be with you. From God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, and it'll be with you in truth and in love. It's almost like he's, he's saying, you and I have been given grace, mercy, and peace, and this is the only way you get it, because of the Father, and because of the Son, and because of truth, and because of love. And apart from God's truth, and apart from God's love, you will never truly experience grace, mercy, and peace. Not the kind of grace you're looking for. Not the kind of peace that allows you to say, you know what? It's okay. It's good. I trust in God the Father and God the Son. My sins are forgiven. I know He's in control. I've got peace. In verse 4, he says something interesting. He says, I have rejoiced greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth as we received the commandment from the Father. I rejoice greatly. Now, if you were to put that in the Greek, it actually reads, I am so stoked. No, it doesn't say that. But that's what it means. He says, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking this is awesome, he's saying, that you're walking in truth. I'm blown away by the fact that it's a great thing. This, here's this elder, this pastor, this leader, and he sees those in the church doing all kinds of things that are going, persecution, Gnosticism, Judaism that they could get sucked into, and this is his heart. In fact, this is the heart of any overseer, any leader, any pastor who teaches the truth, that people are walking in it. They're believing it. I can see it in their lifestyles, to know people are walking in and living out there truth. Why? Because it creates a quality of life that you can't get anywhere else. In, in one of John's writings, in 1 John chapter 2, he, he writes this. He says, therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. What? The truth. Let it abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, the truth of Jesus Christ, his wisdom, his principle, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he's promised us, eternal life. Not just living forever and ever and ever. That's not what eternal life means, although it does mean that. What it means is a quality of life that's filled with peace and mercy and grace. He says, this is what you'll have. 
This is what you'll have from the Lord as you grasp his truth, as you walk in truth, and it brings life. It, it demonstrates a genuine relationship with the Lord. You see someone, you go, man, huh, that person doesn't just believe. They walk it. They live it. A lot of people come to church. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I sing songs. I do this. But the lifestyle doesn't represent his truth and his love. And so that's why John says, hey, uh, I'm so, uh, you know, greatly rejoiced when I see people walking in it, living it out. The principles and the values of Christ, his direction, his wisdom. John was being very emphatic. He was being very personal, very humble, not too proud to say, hey, this is awesome. I love seeing it. John would repeat this over and over through his writings, truth and love, how important they are. John had seen it. John had experienced it. He, he, had, he had touched it. He had walked with the one who demonstrate it like no one ever else had and passed it on, not anchored in a feeling, not some weird desire, not just based on circumstance, but truth and love in a person. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. John had seen it. He had heard it. He had watched it demonstrated. It was Jesus who gave the command. John recorded it in his gospel. Jesus says this, that you love one another. Now listen, as I loved you. Now that's pretty powerful. How did he love you? When you had it all together? When you were just like, of course he loves me. Let me look at me. Who wouldn't love me? Of course Jesus loved me. No, he, he, he loved you while you were still and still are a sinner. Just like he found you. He says, okay, now I want you to love others like that. Just like you find them. Love one another with truth and love. Remember how Jesus loved Matthew, the tax collector? Here's Matthew. You can't be a more hated individual in the Jewish culture than a tax collector who's really a traitor to his own people and taking money from them and using it for personal gain as well as giving it to their enemies that had them under their heavy boot. They hated Matthew. And one day Jesus with his group walks up. He sees Matthew at his table and he goes, hey, Matthew, follow me. And the guys went, you're not picking him, are you? Oh, yeah, I'm picking him. He can't come with us. He's a traitor. He's a tax collector. Jesus turns around and goes, I picked you, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, you did. Well, I'm picking him too. You're no better than him. So Matthew comes in the group. So who is it that you think, oh, I would never, Jesus loves him. Just like he loved you. Yeah, but, but, but he's a tax collector. I don't care. He's on the team. It's like Nathaniel. Remember Nathaniel, the first thing he said when he heard that Jesus might be the Messiah? He said this. He said, what good can come out of Nazareth? I mean, he criticized Jesus and his family and his roots and his hometown. And Jesus said, yeah, but I'm going to pick him. So you love others like I Loved you. Let me tell somebody you're from the Gulf Coast. Or from, they go, what good could come out of Gulf Breeze? You don't even have a bridge. You can't get in town. <laughs> Jesus loved him, and he gave the truth to him. I, I love the story of the Gadarene demoniac. You know, he's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and, and Jesus tells, hey, guys, get in the boat. We're going the other side. Doesn't tell them really why. There's a storm, and all this happens as they finally get there. And there's this crazy man, right? He's got legions of demons. He's, he's in this graveyard. He's all scarred up. He's, they tried to chain him. They can't. And they want to just get out of there, I'm sure. Like, oh, my gosh, you know. And Jesus heals the guy, casts the demons out of him. 
And I bet, because at the end, if you read the story, the guy came up to Jesus while he's getting the boat and said, let me go with you. I'm sure the disciples went, oh, my gosh, now this guy, he's getting in the group. And you can imagine they didn't want him in the group. He's a Gadarene demoniac. He's got these scars all over him. Who wants to walk around with that guy? You know, like, so, so he's like, no, we're not taking him. And Jesus said this to him. He says, no, 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 I've not called you to this. They all went, we got Matthew and this other guy. He said, you go back to your own hometown, Jesus said to the Gadarene demoniac, and you tell them what great things God has done for you. Tell them about truth. Tell them about love. Love is always tied to truth in the scriptures. Here here in verse 6, and we're going to wrap this up. It says, this is love that we walk, that we live it out according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. This, this truth about love, this truth about, you know, uh, one another, and it's, it's not okay, I, I'll do what you say because I love you and you love me. No. It's also about the commandments. It's, see, God gives commandments, He gives principles, He gives truth because it's what's best for us. It's what produces a quality of life. It guides and protects. It gives life. It gives hope. It gives truth. Walk according to his truth. Christianity is not about the feelings of my heart. Oh, I feel like I should look. Oh, feelings come and go. It's not about emotions. I have all kinds of emotions. You know, I love my kids. When they were growing up under me, I had all kinds of emotions and feelings about them. But I also had another kind of love for them that had to do with protection and guidance and wisdom and consequences. And I didn't want them to go through some of the things I went through as a teenager because I didn't have parents who guided me in truth and love. My mom guided me in amazing love, but not much scripture. So... I introduced to them boundaries. I introduced to them consequences. I introduced them love with truth. I, I, I said, I love you, and Mr. Spoon loves you too. <laughs> he doesn't love you as much as I do, but he loves you. And I would let Mr. Spoon discipline them. Because certain things about life were true, but there is also love. And truth needs to hold hands with love. I, you know, I, I know I had situations with, with uh, my kids. I remember one time I was in it with one of my sons, and, and he said to me straight to my face at a certain teenage age, and if you have teenagers, you'll probably experience this. If you don't, awesome. <laughs> but he said, I hate you, Dad. And I said, well, good. A lot of people hate me. And he goes, he goes, he says, I hate you. I go, well, the only reason you hate me is because I love you. And one day you'll see that. I said, God gave me a responsibility to love you, but also to help you know the truth. And I'll do everything I can to hold hands that way. You know, as, as we step into this, this letter, this very personal letter that John writes to these this local church. Let's ask the Lord to help us to love one another, even strangers. You know, I, I was in, in Lowe's the other day, and I'm standing in line, and uh, I'm, you know, have you ever stood in that line to return something? It's really hard to love one another when you're in that line. And I'm standing there and standing there and standing there. I'm thinking, what is that guy returning up there? It only looks like a couple of bolts and nuts. And there's a person in front of me, and I strike up a conversation. And, and you know, it's just this lady, and I mention her purse. It's kind of an interesting-looking purse. And she tells me where she got it. And I said, oh, I've been there before, too. I, I got this wallet there. And, and then we, she said, oh, well, I'm from Kansas City. I said, I used to live in Kansas City. And my wa- wife comes walking up. And she goes, are you trying to hit on this lady? What are you, what, what are you doing? I go, no, I'm just, it's just a conversation. 
I'm trying to demonstrate before I lose my love and truth, you know, just talk, be kind. And, and you, you want to do that. You don't want to be like standing in the line like this. I want to see a manager. <laughs> there was a guy I was, I was checking out after I turned something. He was standing there. He was so angry. He, he'd been waiting about four minutes, and he wanted to see a manager. He wanted a manager. I, I, I was out walking with some of the kids last night. I don't normally go trick-or-treating. I'm usually home passing out the candy, but we have dust everywhere. We're taking up towel. This is a long story. I'm almost finished. <laughs> and I saw some tombstones in this guy's front yard. You know, people put crazy <laughs> stuff in their yard. Oh, my gosh. And one of them said, I died trying to get over the bridge. Another one said, <laughs> this one said, <laughs> this one said, this one made me laugh, I want to see a manager. And I thought, <laughs> he was there until he died. So, I'll get you one. Okay, let's close this out. Let's ask the Lord to help us individually and as a body of believers to love one another combined with truth so that we can grow up and so that we can experience eternal life together and that we can grasp hold of and embrace in our lives grace, mercy, and peace. Such powerful things in our life. And here's John 95 to 100, you know, lived the life. He touched, he handled the truth. He saw the love of Jesus Christ. He says, hey, here's what I want you to focus on. This is what I've learned after all that he'd been through. Love and truth. Powerful, powerful teachers in our life. And as we walk out that, it's a powerful example to a world and a culture that doesn't really have much truth or much love. And you and I, because of the grace and mercy and peace of Jesus Christ, can demonstrate both truth and love.